And tonight, the College of Complexes has Joan Levin as our speaker and presenter. Uh, we'll be speaking, uh, uh, hearing about, uh, and probably speaking about, uh, genetically modified organisms, particularly foods, and uh, the uh, need to uh, have them labeled as such. Uh, so, without any further ado, we'll turn to John Levin and here. Yay! Well, everybody gets extra credit tonight for coming out on a night like this. I'm hoping to see my Thursday walk through the door, my, my colleague. If not, um, I'll say a few words about us both. My name is Joan Levin. I'm the Legislative Director of Illinois Right to Know GMO. And our organization exists mainly for the purpose of getting genetically modified foods labeled in Illinois. Right to know. Right to know for a reason, and we'll get into some of those reasons. Mike represents Organic Consumers Association, a wonderful national organization. And as you probably know, the national standard for organics does not permit genetically modified foods. And Mike has been very much involved in this movement as well to get GMOs labeled so people know what they are and what they're not. Um, as long as we have a rule here against insulting people, I know that none of you will violate this rule, so I had better take it upon myself <laughs> to tell you the insult most commonly thrown at me and some of my colleagues when we talk about these things, and that is, may I, may I quote? Okay. They say to they say to us, "You're anti-science." Oh, yeah. And my answer is, "No, no, no. I am very much pro-science. I am very much pro-science to find out everything we can about about life, about living bodies, about the genome. This is really important information for us to have. But we also need to know enough not to put." things out to the public for public consumption, that is, in their food and in their water and so forth, until we know what the effects might be, what the downside is. And that requires maybe a little more science than we have now, although we already have plenty to suggest that there are some things with GMOs that are a problem. I'm also, besides talking a little bit about GMOs, I want to mention something that's going on in the United States Congress right now, and it affects just about everything else that many of us are interested in. It would affect GMOs, it would affect laws involving fracking. Can you hear me okay with this? Yes. Uh, laws involving environmental protection, health and safety, and that is um, what's called the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is like NAFTA on steroids, and the possibility that we, that Congress may vote to implement something called fast track, which would make all the discussions and debate about this secret, it would, Congress would not have a chance to discuss it or to uh, debate it properly or, or to amend it if necessary. And so this is really important because it's happening in Congress right now today. So in a few minutes, I will give you one of your, this is a college, isn't it? Yes. I'll give you one of your assignments, which will be to call your congressman to ask him or her to say no to fast track. But first I'd like to say a few words about GMOs. Um, first of all, I think it's important to know what GMOs are not, because one of the ways that industry tries to deflect criticism is to say, oh, well, genetic modification, genetic engineering is just the same as the normal uh, procedures that are used by agriculture that have been used for millennia to get bigger and better plants. Um, it just speeds up the process. Things like seed saving, to save the, the seeds with the characteristics that you want to propagate. Or um, cross-pollinization, put the pollen of one uh, variety of plant perhaps into another that you want, again, to get the properties of both of those plants. This is totally different. This is virtually always done in a laboratory. I'm saying virtually because there's some recent talk about some in vivo, in vivo things that are actually happening, but it's basically done in a laboratory. Generally speaking, it's done between two species which would never, ever reproduce together in nature. Uh, most commonly, it's a bacteria 
uh, combined with a um, with a food plant. You would not see this happen in nature. Um, experimentally, they've done things like inserting um, inserting uh, spider genes into a goat to see if the milk could be used for a bulletproof vest. They've used done things like inserting genes from a fish into a strawberry, cold water fish, to see if the strawberry would become more cold resistant. But we're not talking about, but, but this is not what people mean when they say usual traditional me methods of plant breeding. So that's the first thing, that's the first way they try to get this off track. How is this done? I'm going to put down the microphone for a second and use my hands as well as my words. So you have the genetic structure of one plant and you implode it forcibly with genes of DNA from another, from another organism. And during that implosion, we really don't know what happens to the genome. We used to think that the genome was like Lego blocks. Here, you can pull out one trait and put in another trait. But it turns out not to be like that. Genes have their own methods of intercommunication, which we're just aren't starting to be aware of. And so what happens at different points along the genome, uh, for good or for evil, we really don't know yet. And unfortunately, the companies that own the patents on these genetically modified seeds are very loath to give them to even legitimate researchers to experiment on them. Um, for instance, um, if I were a researcher at, say, a fine, you know, one of the big universities, and I said, I want to do a genetic sequencing experiment to see what happens during this process, the companies would say, as they have said to other researchers, well, show us your protocol. And the response then would be, um, well, you know, we don't, we don't really like your protocol very much. Translate that to mean it might not come out favorably for us. You cannot use our seeds. And these seeds are intellectual property. Do you remember the old days when um, you had uh, computer programs and it said if you break this seal, you promise not to give it to anybody else and you could be prosecuted. It's the same things with these, seed, with these seeds. The farmers open them and they have, they're the, they're the thing, uh, a provision on the print on the, on the bag of seeds saying, if you use these seeds for research, that's against the law and we will prosecute you. So that's one of the hangups today. Um, in other countries, they have been able to do some of this research legally and that's a whole other story and I'll, I hope to get to that. So what, are, so what are, are the two main reasons that we have genetic processing of seeds? Do we have any questions now? Have I been clear up to now? Am I repeating what you already know? We usually hold questions till after. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. But if somebody's really lost, you know, give me a nod. Okay, okay. What are the two main reasons that we find companies want to modify, genetically modify, genetically engineer their seeds? We read all these wonderful things about, oh, we'll have tastier tomatoes and prettier strawberries and whatever. But that isn't what it's all about. It's about the money. And the money is in the big commodity crops. And right now, the big commodity crops, the two things that we need is to kill the weeds and to kill the insects. Those are the two big things. That's where the money is. Okay. So the first thing is killing the weeds. How do we do that? How many of you use Roundup? Are familiar with Roundup? Yeah, Roundup's a, a, called glyphosate. It's a poisonous, it's a poisonous weed killer. But mostly people just, you know, they put it on the weed. If they get it on the other plants, they're going to kill those plants, right? So if you sprayed it over, it would be much more convenient to spray it over a whole field. But of course, you'd kill the corn or you'd kill the soybeans. So what they do, they breed seeds that are Roundup ready, and Roundup ready corn and Roundup ready soybeans. That, so that you can spray this glyphosate, this Roundup, this poisonous uh, toxic substance all over the crops, which may be used for feed, it will run off in the water, it will be used in much greater quantity than it would normally be used, and then the corn and the soybean won't die. Of course, they'll be full of Roundup, but that's, you know, that's not their problem. So that's the first thing. The second thing is insects. Um, oh, and by the way, the Roundup, the, the, the gene for being Roundup ready comes from a bacteria that is able to um, withstand Roundup, and that's the gene that's inserted. There's another bacteria 
And I'll tell you the name and you can forget it right away, but you can't forget its initials. Um, it's called Bacillus thurgi thurgiensis. And BT are its initials. You'll never forget <laughs> GT, right? You'll never forget GT. Okay. And there's this bacteria produces a toxin that kills insects. And how does it kill them? It kills them by um, basically bursting the gut of these insects, causing them to die. So they breed plants that have, with, with the genes from this bacillus, that produce inside the plant what's called Bt toxin. And that is supposed to kill the insect, which it does. But the problem is, Bt toxin normally isn't even, isn't that terribly toxic. In fact, it's used by organic gardeners fairly safely because it washes off, it biodegrades, it isn't terribly uh, toxic in the concentrations used. But when it's used this way to be actually produced within the cellular structure of the plant, it becomes much more toxic, and of course it can't be washed off. And it's not going to biodegrade, it, it's in there. So that when you're eating something that's Bt, that has been bred to, to produce Bt toxin, you are eating that toxin, the same toxin that's bursting the gut of insects. Now, is it bursting your gut? We don't know. But one thing that bacteria have the capacity to do, and this has been demonstrated time and time again, is to share their genetic structure with other bacteria. What do you have inside your gut that you need for digestion? You have the so-called good bacteria, right? So what's going to happen when these Bt, when these Bt uh, toxin containing the, the genetic material from the, that bacteria gets into your gut? And we've had some experiments that actually show that it can linger in the gut um, and starts interbreeding with your with your uh, normal gut flora, which then could become little Bt toxin producing factories. These are all things that are theoretical. They haven't been totally demonstrated in a laboratory, but there are enough clues to suggest that we need to know more. And in fact, in 1992, when the, um, when the Food and Drug Administration came out with a guidance to industry about these new variety of plants, meaning genetically modified plants, um, they basically said, oh, this is, these are not going to be toxic, they're not going to be a problem, they don't need to be labeled, they're just like any other plants. Um, that document was produced under the guidance of a Food and Drug uh, Administration employee by the name of Michael Taylor, who still the food safety czar, but before that he had been um, a high-ranking uh, lawyer with Monsanto Corporation. So that's a whole, that's a whole other story about the revolving door in play. But when that document, before it was published, hey Mike, woohoo! Before that document was published, it was, um, I'm sorry, I told um, it was um, circulated to employees of the Food and Drug Administration, these are the enemies, the PhDs, the senior scientists, who said almost to a man or a woman, this stuff, we don't know enough about it. We have some problems. Here, what some potential problems are. Yes, do more studies, but don't release it to the whole population because it's not the same. But they were overridden by the um, by their um, superiors in, in the political superiors, the presidential appointees at the time. This was under the Bush administration. But I'm not going to um, castigate the Republicans or the Democrats. They've both been equally bad about this. Every administration since has been equally bad, including this one. I'm very sorry to say. So these are some of the things that are going on. So from a health standpoint, we don't know. There's another thing that, that concerns many of us. You, you know, Henry Kissinger, we all love to hate, but he said some things that were kind of smart. One of them was control oil, and you control nations, control food, and you control the people. Well, we have company, about six companies, the largest of which is Monsanto, but also Syngenta, BASF, Bayer, Dow, um, a couple of others that basically have their eye on having 95% of the world's food crops under production, under patent, uh, in, as quickly as they can get there. Well, think about that. Think of the world's food supply of the main commodity crops under the, under the control of a few corporations. This is kind of scary. So the, this is another reason. Another reason is that the runoff from some of these things is pretty toxic. The, the glyphosate running, runoff, 
the U.S. Geological Survey has already found that we have um, significant amounts in of glyphosate in our Chicago area water, which is kind of interesting since you know, Chicago isn't exactly your big farm, uh, but it, it runs off, it gets in the air, and so forth. So these are some of the things that we're concerned about, and this is why we want labeling. We have a bill in the state legislature now, Senate Bill 1666. There's some information, uh, this green sheet, that you can see copies of it there, uh, on one side, it has some very brief information on what genetically modified foods are. Um, it, has, it has some reasons why you might want labeling, some sources of other information. On the back, ignore the stuff about the hearings. They already took place this summer. Maybe some of you, did any of you have any of the hearings this summer? The one in Chicago? Yay for you! Yay for you! Okay, so here are the names of the, uh, some senators on the Agriculture Committee. But also importantly, how many of you know who your state senator is who represents you in Springfield? Good, go to the head of the class. Who is it? Uh, senator uh, Heather Staines and yes. Representative Kelly Cassidy. Good, good. They need to hear from you. Senator Staines needs to hear from you saying, you know what, when maybe in a, in a month or two when the legislature reconvenes, if this bill comes in front of you, we want your support on it. Um, who's yours? Did you, did you raise your hand? No, okay. The rest of you, learn who your state senator is. Um, I, can, I can help you with that if you want. Um, get in touch with me, I'll leave my card out there on the table too. Now, we have something going on. Mike, can I say a few words about TPP and Fast Track, or do you want to talk? No, okay. I've had it, I'll, I'll... Okay, then we thought, we thought up until this fall that all we'd have to be talking about was the state bill, the state labeling bill. This is a bill, it's not a citizen initiative. It's not like in California or in Washington where people actually voted for the initiative. Um, Illinois does not make that easy. So this is a bill in the legislature like, that our members of our General Assembly will vote on. But something happened this fall that came out, basically it came out a while back through WikiLeaks. Um, it's been very hush up up to now about that's happening in Congress. And that is this Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is not simply a trade agreement, but it's a, basically it would create a compact between companies, between countries, but even companies could have trade negotiation status in it. It's a very complex structure, and it basically would allow a company to say, you know what? Your laws are interfering with our profits. Get rid of them. Get rid of them, or pay us for our, or for our profits that we're losing. This is pretty scary. Um, this little card has information on the other side about it. So right now, does everybody know who your United States congressman is? Cause, yes. Good, because your United States congressman is voting on that right now. Um, there's a yellow sheet out there that tells you if you don't know who your U.S. congressman is, how to find your U.S. congressman, and what to say in some sources of more information. Because in addition to the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership, there is coming up to Congress right now something called Fast Track. Fast Track is a nickname for something called the, um, the Trade Promotion Authority. And basically, it allows Congress, which has the authority under the Constitution to negotiate trade agreements, to outsource that to the president and the president's appointees, who can then work in secret and would present the Congress with a fully formed uh, piece of legislation, which Congress would not be free to amend. They could simply vote on it up or down. So this is very dangerous. Um, you remember the Boston Tea Party? Remember that? Yeah. We will be well. I was there. But, but Mike was there. He was standing on the boat, throwing that tea overboard because the British Crown was imposing these high tariffs. So the framers of our Constitution said, wait a minute, this was pretty bad. This is what we fought the revolution over. So one of the things we fought the revolution over. This was pretty bad. So when we write our Constitution, let's make sure that negotiating trade agreements is placed within the branch of government that's closest to the people, and that's the Congress. That's the Congress. That's the one that you have the, the easiest time voting in or out. And so this is one of the enumerated powers of the Congress. And so for the Congress to vote, to give this away, 
to um, countries and companies and to appointees of the president who can remain secret basically goes against all the trade, all the, um, the, the, the uh, checks and balances of the Constitution and really one of the things we fought the revolution about. So in this sense, I have become a tea partier, a real a tea partier in the, in the true sense of the word. And so this is something that is going to be voted on in the next couple of days. Um, it's already before the Congress. So if you would, your main assignment that I'm going to give you tonight is when you get home, um, what's today? This is Saturday, Monday morning. Find out who your congressman is. Call your congressman's office in Washington and just say, please vote no on fast track. It goes against the Constitution. The Congress has the authority under the Constitution to negotiate trade agreements. They're the ones who can do, who should do it. So say no on fast track. And then when TPP goes down the line, we can fight that too. Uh, Mike is laying out a whole bunch of literature there. And I have some literature over here. Um, I have this little um, fact sheet from Occupy um, on the TPP and, and Fast Track. It has a lot of information in a small place. Um, Mike's going to tell you more about shopping for GMOs, how to shop GMO free, because that's one of the things that's going to stop them in their tracks. There's a shopping guide there. Mike has some shopping info. Here's doctor's health warnings that will give you some idea why medically GMOs are not such a great thing to have in your diet. Um, a yellow sheet on stopping fast track and TPP with a little more information. There are some buttons like, like I'm wearing, and you can take one if you'll promise, promise, promise to wear it. And now without further ado, yay, yay. They're little ones. You can wear them anywhere. You can wear them to work. You can wear them anywhere. And people will say to you, ooh, why are you against General Motors cars? And that's your opening to tell them about GMOs. <laughs> so, Mike. Why? My name is Mike Dershman. I'm with the Organic Consumer Association. Uh, I work with Joan a lot in a group called Illinois Right to Know GMO. Um, and I don't know, uh, one of the things that most uh, people ask about uh, relating to GMOs is how to avoid them. You know, they, they're very pervasive in our society. So um, I guess what I'll talk about a little bit of how much, how, how pervasive they are and then how to avoid them. Um, roughly, um, there, there's, I don't know, five, ten, 10 different GMOs that are out there now, or nine or 10, um, most of them food products. Um, soybeans is the biggest one. 95% of all soybean in North America is GMO now, uh, genetically modified. Uh, roughly 85 to 90% of corn, and that's all feed corn, corn you use for processing uh, to make food products uh, and now also sweet corn as well the yellow sweet corn it's all GMO you can avoid some corns but you can eat corn products and avoid by eating organic or white any white corn red corn or blue corn is fine and also all popcorn is fine too those are smaller commodity markets or smaller specialty markets uh, what they did is they went after the varieties that are the big commodity markets, the, the, the lo where most corn is grown for either animal feed or making processed foods uh, or various different other <coughs> processed things they do with it. Uh, so, 85, basically, 85 to 90 percent of our corn and 95 percent of our soy now is uh, GMO, and that's in North America. Similarly to uh, uh, sugar, sugar from sugar beet. Okay, and uh, canola oil and cottonseed oil. Those five, um, you know, so corn, soy, cottonseed oil, canola oil, and sugar, those five are 95% of all processed packaged goods. One or more of those ingredients are in everything. That's why it's so pervasive in our society now. Um, and, you know, again, there's a reason why they went after those five products. Um, now I gotta say some uh, um, big particulars about uh, uh, sugar. Most sugar from sugar cane, back in the day, most of our sugar came from sugar cane. And any sugar now from sugar cane is fine. But unfortunately, the, the industries have switched to non-sugar cane sugars, uh, either corn sweeteners or various other things. But if it says from sugar, 
and it doesn't say sugar cane with it, assume then you should assume to be safe that it's from sugar beet because most most sugar nows are from sugar beet. Um, now, oh, the other the other products. Um, there's a small smaller amount of zucchini. Uh, 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 quick neck squash, alfalfa. I'm forgetting the other one. Papaya. Papaya, yeah, yes, papaya, papaya from Hawaii. Yeah, thank you. Uh, papaya from elsewhere should be fine, but if it says from Hawaii, and it's likely to be uh, and not all papaya from Hawaii is GMO, but there's no way to track. It's the same thing with the sugars and the other things. There's Just no tracking. That's one of the reasons why we want mandatory labeling. So if it says uh, from Hawaii be, to be safe, just don't eat anything from Hawaii or any beet, uh, uh, papayas from Hawaii. And then there's also Quest brand tobacco. Um, uh, it's a cheap generic uh, tobacco brand that's genetically engineered. Now there's other things out there that are non-food items, other non-food items that are genetically engineered. Trees and uh, a type of grass they plant in uh, 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 golf courses and stuff like that. Uh, coming to market, uh, I'm sure you mentioned a little bit about this. I'm not, well, I'm not sure you did. I wasn't here. <laughs> Whatever it was, it should be repeated. Co com coming to market, uh, or what they want to start forcing on us, is a new corn and new soy variety that will tolerate, you know, like there's this Roundup Ready, yes. Roundup Ready soybean and corn. They want to they want a new variety because there's these super weeds now that are uh, being tolerant of the uh, of Roundup, so they want to start using 2,4-D, which is a component of Agent Orange. They want that's coming, uh, not just the GMO corn and soy, but huge amounts of 2,4-D they want to start spraying on foods we eat, which is crazy. You know, I mean they're having problems in. In, the, in, in, in East Asia, um, Vietnam and other places that they're still using that stuff and people are still, there's birth defects and all, all sort of stuff going on over there. It, it, it's criminal that uh, some of these companies, including American companies, are still producing that stuff and using it over there. Um, something we can't use here. Uh, another problem with the TPP is a, a race to the bottom. They might, you know, <laughs> well, it's another, I'm getting off on tangents here. Uh, let me stick to where we can go in our in our personal lives to avoid GMOs. So, to avoid GMOs, anything that's organic is GMO free automatically. So, if you if you go to the store and if you can get organic or source your foods organic, that's the most ideal thing. Then you don't have to worry about what ingredient or anything. But if you're not buying within the organic areas then you need to either look for signs that say GMO free project or GMO free on it um, or you know no like the ten different things I just told you about avoid those unless they are labeled GMO free or say if you go to uh, Whole Foods um, anything if you go into Whole Foods know that not everything there is GMO free okay but anything their store brand, their 365 brand, and they deserve credit for this, um, uh, know that that is all GMO free as well. Uh, the same thing at Trader Joe's. If you buy a Trader Joe's brand type product, that they do their own tracking. Uh, we wish they were a little bit more transparent with that. You know, we give them, we give them a little nudge in the side on that one. But uh, there's been some testing and things we were tested for. They they. They're GMO free as well. So, um, but you know, if you go to your average grocery store, Dominic's, you know, well, not anymore. You know, well, how many jobs do we lose there, by the way? About 10,000 or something like that? 6,000? It's disgusting. Um, yeah, we can thank Safeway for that one, right? So, um, so anyways. Go to the Albertsons or, or Jewel or Mariano's or any of these grocery stores that are out there. Um, uh, uh, it's roughly 80, 80, well, some people say as low as 70, 75%. Some people say it's up to 85% of everything on, those, on the shelves there.
contain GMOs. Um, so, um, and if you want to ask me more questions, not everyone's going to remember all this stuff, you know, just hearing it once or twice. Um, I'm available to give you another spiel on it. Uh, but again, it's, it's corn, soy, cottonseed oil, canola oil, and sugar. Those are the main things to avoid unless uh, it's organic or it says cane sugar or it's white corn or blue corn or red corn. Um, but pretty much uh, those are the small amount, those are small amounts of op options that are out there. Um, but if you know what you're doing, you can't avoid GMOs you know, within a certain reasonable uh, knowledge. But not everyone's going to get there. And I guess I'm going to make a point about labeling. That's why we want mandatory labeling. So everyone can avoid this because not everyone's going to get... 90% of people, you know, so says uh, um, New York Times and, and a whole bunch of other polls that have been put out there. They all come up with rough, roughly 90% of Democrats, Republicans, everybody want mandatory labeling so they can avoid. So um, that's what we really need. And Europe has that. Some 60 other countries around the world have it. Either mandatory labeling and or straight up bans or some kind of major restrictions on, on GMOs and what they can grow there. Um, the rest of the world does this, but you know we're, we're in a special place here uh, that are controlled by corporations, you know, our corporatocracy that we live in here. So I'm not sure that uh, I need to go into much of that. I think I got a, a friendly choir here on that one. <laughs> but um, you have a question? Why is genetically modified food bad for you? Oh, there's lots of reasons. She explained it. Um, uh, well, there's, there's many different... There's many different reasons and different category of reasons. Um, we can talk about allergens and inflammation, and there's some pretty document, well documented stuff that, uh, that they're increasing the amount of allergens and inflammation in people. Inflammation in, in general is a problem. Um, and then there's uh, when they they use this uh, um, uh, what they call a gene gun. Uh, um, and there's something called uh, uh, collateral damage. Uh, so they're testing, when they come up with a new thing, and they you make all kinds of tests to see what kind of proteins and some things are dangerous and some things are not so dangerous. They do a lot of testing, okay? But the, the, the amount of combinations of things that could happen are astronomical. And they can't test for all of those things. And there's, a lot, what they call collect. See, they, they treat this as if things just plug in and plug out like Legos, you know, like genes do, and they don't. They, there's all sort of other damage that occurs, and they and they don't know. So there's a lot of questions. There's uh, some 20. That book back there it says genetic roulette on it. It, it outlines, uh, I think, like 24 different health risks or uh, adverse adverse reactions that we know about, and then some 40 or 50 other. Uh, theoretical risks. Um, uh, yeah. um, I have the doctor's health risks for sure. sure yeah. uh, are, are you opening up to questions now? Well, yeah, I, I've got more more spiel to do on various different okay. things. Okay, let's but go, go ahead and answer that spiel. Well, we can go back and forth. I don't yeah, why right. did he ask a question? All right, go ahead and finish. <laughs> because Tim, I'll ask you. Okay, I, yeah. We can, well, um, questions are good. Um, all right, I have a little bit more to talk about. Um, so that's how to avoid GMOs, and that's how pervasive they are in our society. Um, there's a, a, I talked about this new thing on uh, um, the 2,4-D, uh, Agent Orange basically, uh, resistant crops coming. Um, um, did we talk about the uh, federal laws? No, um, we didn't get the, the federal laws that they're trying to, you know, get around or get yeah, ahead of no, us with. No, we okay. didn't go there. So All right. One of the things the industry is trying to do right now, uh, the Grocery Manufacturers Association, who's been fighting us tooth and nail on this for years. In fact, in California, in Washington State, where they have ballot initiatives, we almost won on both of those states. It was like nearly 50-50 in terms of the vote but we were outspent, like 10 to 1 or 5 to 1. Um, 
in uh, California. I think uh, they spent like $50 million and we, we spent something under $10 million. Uh, a similar dynamic happened in Washington State. Well, the, the grocery store, grocery, uh, the GMA, Grocery Manufacturers Association, is this like in big industry that represent all these, you know, uh, craft and all these big companies, food companies. And the food companies t are taking a big hit for fighting labeling laws, okay, in, big, in terms of public relations, in terms of people's opinion of them. So what they want to do now is start funneling their money through the GMA to do the same thing, to continue fighting, but that way they don't have to take a hit. But in Washington State, uh, they were sued, basically. Uh, uh, there was, suit, there was a private party that tried to sue, and then that failed. But then the attorney general of that state sued and showed that there was a campaign, uh, um, campaign finance violations uh, going on. And they had to reveal who gave money to the GMA. To the, it was revealed it was the same old big food industry, you know, Food Inc. funding everything again. Um, so what they're trying to do now is they're kind of they're kind of like taking a defensive measure now. They're, they're, they're going on the offense, but they're acknowledging uh, indirectly that we are winning. <coughs> uh, the Cheerios thing uh, last week, did you guys see that about Cheerios? Yeah. Cheerios' main brand, not, not all the uh, company's uh, brands, in fact, just, just their main, main company, their, their main Wait, thing by you know, the yellow box. No, just the only one doesn't have any GMO ingredients in it anyway, or any products that have GMOs except for one, sugar. So what they're doing is they're making sure their sugar source is not from sugar beet, and make sure it's uh, something other than sugar beet. But there's no tracking, and there's no third party verification of anything. We just have to take their word for it. That's what volunteer labeling is gonna look like if we get volunteer labeling out of the federal government. That's why we're pushing so hard for mandatory labeling. <coughs> Because mandatory labeling requires checks and balances, you know, checking, making, you know, verification, following it from the field to the middlemen, to the manufacturers, to us. We'll know where it's coming from. Um, so what the industry right now is trying to do is say, oh yeah, we're for labeling, you know, with their tongue in their cheek, of course. Um, but we're for labeling, but they want a very weak law. They, they want, they're trying to get ahead of the curve on us right now. Um, they know they're losing, and they're trying, they're trying to get a weak law. And um, that, I believe, uh, well, we need to let our, let our congressmen and senators know that that's not going to be acceptable, that we don't want that. We want mandatory labeling, a strong policy. Um, there's other things. Uh, I mean, there's, <laughs> well, not on GMO issues, but some other pesticides and herbicide issues. I mean, they want to start using, you know about the bees being, uh, the bee populations going down, 40 to 90% loss last winter. It was huge. Um, um, and what, what they're doing is they're breeding bees now, and basically what it amounts to like factory farms for bees. The problem on those factories, on those farms, where they're producing more domestic bees, uh, where uh, the agricultural industry needs them, they they basically are mingling with each other and sharing each other's uh, uh, different funguses and, and other problems that they have with each other, and that's a that's a problem. And then there's uh, people can point to microwaves or other other things that cause bee colony collapse, but. One of the big things um, in, in the, the body of proof of this is only increasing. Uh, even the European Union uh, has come up with studies, and Russia as well uh, are pointing to this. They won't use, they don't want nicotine, what they call nicotine, <coughs> you know, nicotine in cigarettes. Basically, um, that is a good uh, 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 insecticide. It, it, but unfortunately. When Bayer and Sergenta, those are, those are the two companies that are making this stuff now. Um, Bayer and Sergenta make, mass produce this stuff and are spraying it on agricultural things Corn. everywhere. And that's, what, that's the biggest uh, uh, <coughs> um, insecticide being used right now. Yeah. 
Um, and there's not that much we can do about that. Or I mean, I shouldn't say that. There is stuff we can do about that. But what we can mostly do is they're also using it on, like, you go to a home garden center, you get uh, what they call bee friendly plants, flowers, basically, things that have flowering. Uh, they pre treat that stuff with these nicotoids as well. And it doesn't go away. It, it kills the bees, you know, kills and or majorly disrupts their brain function for months or even years. The stuff, the stuff is very uh, long lasting. Um, so one of our things to we're pushing right now uh, is to get people aware about the nicotinoids in general is to start boycotting some of these home centers to make them stop using this stuff okay and that will help the consumer understand not only about the flowers but also nicotinoids and nicotinoids in general um, neonix um, is the is the more short version to use so all right, that's not exactly GMO issues, but it's one of the things I'm working on right now. So, talked about Cheerios. Uh, um, there is a, uh, uh, on January 27th to 30th, there's a GMO virtual, uh, kind of a virtual online thing. You can go to school and learn everything you need to know about GMOs. Um, and you can go to our website and learn about that. That's, that's in our, our most current um, newsletter in the Organic Consumer Association. Our literature that we have around here has our website on it. So I think that's it for now. All right. You're all with question? Yeah. All right. Oh, all right. Talk about uh, Gene Harker. Okay, could I have something to add? Yes, go ahead. Could I have something? Let, let, let him finish. Go ahead, finish. Okay. Go ahead and finish yeah, first. Go ahead. Okay. Use the mic. I respond to your question. First of all, this Doctor's Health Warnings brochure has quite a few things in it. Most of what we know about the health effects we learn from animal studies. Do you all understand why it wouldn't be ethical to do human studies? Prospective human studies where you have an experimental group and a control group. The reason is because you have to give full disclosure to people before you use them in an experiment. And if I started to tell you that we know from our animal experiments that every system of the body, the immune system, the, 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 the reproductive system, the urogenital system, the respiratory system, the, the, the nervous system, is ad, can be adversely impacted as we've seen in rat studies. Um, uh, would you like to be a subject in this experiment? How many of you would raise your hand and say, oh yes, me, me, me? You would be, uh, uh, no, I don't think absolutely so. Absolutely. Yes. You would be, a, you would be an experimental? Yes. You, you would allow yourself to be used in an experiment? Yes, absolutely. You would, okay. That's one person. Um, most of the time there is nobody once they see the evidence. Um, and I'll give you one other piece of, of this which is important because it's been in the news a lot. There is a French scientist named Gilles Eric Serolini. He's been working in this area for years. He's from France. And he was able to get seeds that were identical, that were the Monsanto seeds. And he set up his experiments with rats to show that, um, to, to basically replicate Monsanto's own experimental protocols. In other words, the, the, the kinds of rats he used, Sprague Dolly rats, which are prone to getting tumors, but Monsanto uses them too. The number of rats, the, the, what he fed them, how he fed them, everything he did exactly the same as Monsanto does with its studies that seem to show safety. With one difference, he extended them past the normal 90-day uh, period, which in the life of a rat separates short-term from a longer-term study. Once, he, they start, once the rat started exceeding that threshold, a lot of things began to happen. The study was set up with small numbers of rats because it was a toxicity study. It wasn't a cancer study, it wasn't a tumor study, it wasn't even a safety study, it was a toxicity study. So he used the small number of rats that you need for a toxicity study, and the rats all showed toxicity. Okay, so that are, are the, the, the number needed to show significance statistically significant occurrence of toxicity. But as he kept going further, he began to see a lot of other problems with those rats. And finally, what he saw 
were these enormous tumors, these enormous mammary tumors. They were not cancer, but they were enormous tumors um, that were like the size of your fist in, in a rat, which is a pretty big tumor. Now, these were not, these were not cancer studies, so it, or tumor studies, so it would not have been appropriate for him to say, conclude that this was the, the goal of the, of the study. But what he did do is exactly what a scientist should do in this situation. He said, we, we have these unexpected events and he, he noted the tumors. Well, um, what scientists should have done all over the world was said, hey, that's an interesting and significant event. We should replicate his study. We should do exactly the same thing, carry it out you know, the same amount of time and see if we get the same results. That didn't happen. Right now, the European Commission is raising money to do such a study, but no, no scientists in the United States have, have, have replicated or even talked about replicating it, let alone Monsanto, uh, who is the sponsor of the seed. Instead, what they did, they orchestrated a smear campaign against him. Um, in every single paper, this is bad science, it, was, it wasn't a cancer study. No, he said it wasn't a tumor study, it wasn't a cancer study. He didn't have enough rats? No, he didn't have enough rats because it wasn't that kind of study. He was just reporting an unusual event. Um, he, the, uh, what was the, he used the wrong kind of rats. He used Sprague Dolly rats, which are more susceptible to tumors. Right, he didn't. He, he did use those rats, but that's the kind of rat Monsanto uses. And in other words, point after point after point, he saw these adverse effects. Now, when that study is replicated enough times, then we'll see enough that would make me say, okay, I'll be part of this experiment. But until then, I don't think it's pro appropriate to ask 300 million people in the United States to be the guinea pigs in this experiment, especially since there's no reporting system. Any other drug, any other food product, we have reporting systems that if you have an adverse effect uh, of, a, of a drug, you let your doctor know, the doctor can let the Food and Drug Administration know, or you let the drug company know, and they must let the Food and Drug Administration know, they collect all that stuff in the computer. There's nothing like that for for GMOs. The FDA okay. consider, considered it to, uh, to be the same kind of food or no, no, no real different, which is uh, completely BS, shown to be BS now, but that was their ruling. So thus they don't need to do all different kind of safety studies and whatnot, so they claim. So they rely on the companies to report, to do their own testing and report, and it's up to them to voluntarily report good or bad. The, Which, the of American, course, we can really trust The American them, right? Association for Environmental Medicine um, did a position paper uh, in 2009. The, the, um, the URL for it is on the screen sheet. You can find it easily. And, and they basically looked at experimental literature with rats. And by the way, rats have the same kind of P450 immune um, mechanism that we have, um, enzyme system. They have many other physiological things in common with humans. That's why we use them for experiments. And those rats, they, they show studies with rats having problems with every system of their body. And so, you know, we, we need to find out more. Uh, did you get your question in? No. Well, all right. Can I follow this on the essay? Uh, the question I had was, I heard that uh, three of the main uh, modified foods are corn, soybeans, and alfalfa. I'm weak on agriculture, but they sound like stuff you would feed to cattle, yeah. uh, sheep, uh, chickens, and uh, pigs, and I assume that means the meat is then modified. Yeah. Is that right? Bingo. That's that's how we see it. Yeah. Uh, not everyone sees it that way, yeah. but that you're at. You know, it's common sense. If you're eating GMO content constantly, that stuff's going to integrate into your body, just like the meat is integrating in our bodies as we eat that stuff. Okay, and, Jack. And growing inside yeah, actually, our guts. Not in the light of this, I've got two questions: a follow-up to this and a follow-up to the prior thing about the French deal. With respect to this, when you buy pork, let's say, from Whole Foods, if it's not organic, does that mean that those pigs might have been fed GMO? That's my understanding. Yes. Okay, all right. Yeah. To back up to the French, the story about the yeah. French guy. 
You talked about how Monsanto, et cetera, came up with all these sort of smeary like things. Well, I don't know if it was Monsanto. Well, you know, all right, the, the point is out there by, the, yeah, the smears, yeah. were the smears done only in the literature in this country, or was it all over Europe too? Where, where was this? Uh, you know, I'm really mainly aware of what was done in this country. I mean, but every major newspaper, I mean, the, the Tribune had a big editorial of, called Corny Science, and, and you know, the, the, the New York Times, and, and um, just it, uh, sci even Scientific American, which a few years earlier had derided the practice of, of um, industry and not allowing scientists to have access to its seeds um, for their experiments, um, all of a sudden said, well, labeling isn't necessary because this is just, you know, what, it wasn't good science. And, and basically the journal withdrew the article and now it's being attacked by uh, scientists all over the world who say you The journal withdrew which the, article? The journal withdrew Seralini's article where it was published. The, the journal is, uh, they went through a financial or a yeah. restructuring yeah. and the people who uh, were over. against, you know, basically in the pockets of industry took over the journal and pulled that article. And the answer they gave was because it didn't come to definite conclusions, and which many other scientists have commented, saying, you know, if that's the basis for an article being published, you might as well just withdraw about half the things in the scientific literature. Um, it was that's become a big firestorm now. Um, um, did I answer your question about health, about health effects? Except for one last yeah. minor point. Mm -hmm. uh, don't you think it would be advantageous to increase the amount of genetic food down in like a cellular one field and maybe make the north side a... Right, like maybe in maybe in certain uh, segments of Congress, I don't know. Ayala? Yeah. You, Ayala? Yeah. Well, By the way, I misunderstood your question oh. before about volunteering to... <laughs> Yeah. Uh, to, to the intervention. I, I thought you were asking about release of information, um, which is also a problem in um, human subjects. Release of oh, medical no, oh, information. No, no, that, that's a whole yeah, no, that I would release. So but you, you will not volunteer to be a I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't well, like to eat poison. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Kind of, yeah. so I, I have to chicken have out to, of it, yes, <laughs> before you sign me in. But um, I have a question, and that is how can we legally fight in this plutocracy, in this corporation? Um, there are two issues here. One is the labeling, right? Mm -hmm. So I understand that labeling, we can, there must be, you are the lawyer, there must be a way that the public can insist on transparency of ingredients, just like now we, uh, there must be. But further than that, um, to prove toxicity, that's the thing, uh, isn't there a legal way to protect the people by, I, I don't know the law that well, by proving a, very, a high probability of danger to people's health, which will already prevent them from putting it already in the food and experimenting on us <coughs> until we have enough data on animals. And yes, and they say, well, what's on animals doesn't mean people and all that, but there must be something about the probability of harm. This is, this is exactly what the senior scientists at the Food and Drug Administration were saying. These are, the, these are the MDs, the PhDs, the DVMs, the people with the scientific background. This is exactly what they said. The precautionary principle is what it's, we're the, it's basically the, the precautionary principle. And they were overridden by the political people who were above them. That's, that's, that is the issue. What we're hoping is that in Europe, we're GMOs are labeled, people just don't want them, they don't buy them, and therefore they're not sold. The same big companies here that sell, that sell GMO products in the United States sell the same thing about GMOs in Europe because they know that the Europeans won't buy them. And so the hope is that by labeling, um, you know, a lot of people will just say, hey, you know, I'd, I'd rather have a different product. And if you even change a 5% share uh, of the market, um, companies take note of that. So this is this is basically the fact that we're 
2% makes a difference, 8% makes a difference, and 5% can push it over the edge to the tipping point. Uh, Ted, did you have your hand up? Uh, no, but actually, I do have a question. No. Um, with global warming, okay, there's an overwhelming scientific consensus that yeah. uh, you know it's happening and humans are causing it, and it's a horrendous problem. Um, I don't hear, and I'd love to hear this, but I don't hear that there's a sci any kind of scientific consensus that GMOs are dangerous. I mean, uh, is there anything like that? Or what, you know, yeah, what's the deal with that? There's a problem to you know to do research costs money. Um, and in American universities, Monsanto and, and the industry has basically insinuated itself. Like if you went down to the University of Illinois um, and you were really interested in studying this in the, in the literature of the agriculture school, you could find yourself a cozy seat in the Monsanto wing of the University of Illinois Agriculture Library. Um, when we were having hearings um, this summer, these were state hearings um, on, on this bill. And we would talk with a number of academicians from institutions all over the state, and they would say things to us, and we would say, would, would you be willing to say this, you know, at, in, a, in a public hearing? Well, <coughs> no, I think I have something else I have to do that week. Um, it, it, the only professors who were able to really come out and, and speak in favor of labeling were emeritus professors, some very distinguished ones, but they were emeritus. Their careers were no longer on the line. So. This, this, has been, this has been a problem. There are scientists who have come out and spoken quite vociferously. I don't leave my card out there with my email address on it. And it has a little mini shopping guide on the back. Um, um, do you want to go into this some more? Because it really is a problem. I'll get some answers about the global warming. I work, I'm a climate justice yeah. activist. Oh, okay. All right. called Rising Tide. I'm going to finish answering his question. All right. On um, global warming issues. Um, it's a problem of industrial agriculture in general, especially when it comes to CAFOs, um, but okay. uh, confined animal feeding operating with factory farms, um, and you know, plant-based diet versus you know animal or omnivorous diet type issues relating to that. Um, most of the grain, the corn and soy that we grow, GMO-wise, goes to feed animals, so that. Animal-based <coughs> diets, you know, you know, dairy-based or meat itself or whatever. So that's one one aspect of the answer to that. Um, of course, um, there's huge amounts of hydrocarbons uh, uh, being burnt up to you know all those tractors and all the shipping it everywhere and all that. There's a lot in, just in terms of transportation and the actual production. There's a lot of fuel fossil fuels being burnt up to do that, more than there needs to be. Um, there's a roughly 90% inefficiency co coefficient when it comes to eating animal parts products versus eating uh, plant-based directly. Um, try not to use the V word. <laughs> um, but, uh, but then also on those CAFOs, there's a lot of methane produced. Um, that gets it, you know, that's a, a more toxic or more potent greenhouse gas than even hydrocarbons are. Uh, uh, and then there's also the, the fertilizer that grow all the soy and corn and all that. A lot of nitrites are used. That's another greenhouse, major greenhouse gas. Uh, the, world, the World Food Organization uh, has produced a whole bunch of good stuff on that, relating to all that. And all this, I think, relates to GMOs because GMOs are now the main food for all this. So. All right, Wes Weiger. Yeah. Uh, I suppose you're familiar with the situation in St. Louis where Monsanto has its headquarters. Right. You know, you know, a few years ago, they had a huge industry meeting and there were big demonstrations at the same time and the Green that? Party met there. And, uh, yeah, in fact, uh, at the end of this month is their next uh, uh, annual general meeting, uh, their shareholders meeting. And one, one of us go in uh, each year for the past, now two years in a row now, and we're about to do it again, third year in a row, one of us will be going in and speaking to their shareholders, where the rest of us are outside protesting. I've been there a couple of years in a row now, I'm doing that, and as well as other things that happen in St. Louis, relevant to Monsanto. So, Someone wants to take a trip, I'll tell you how. 
Charles, did you have a question? Yeah. Um, we had a previous speaker on this some time ago, and her assertion was there was no research establishing genetically engineered foods as being harmful. And Monsanto had effectively, as you were talking well, about. if you about, repeat a lie enough, people through a lot litigation of people believe it. You had stifled any research in this regard. You know, well, sometimes people frame it saying, can you prove that it's harmful or can you prove it's not harmful? <laughs> Keep in mind that the biological sciences do not prove anything. Mathematics proves, okay? Mathematics proves, logic proves, but biological sciences demonstrate. And when you, any, any experiment that you do in biology, you will, whether it's a prospective thing or a retrospective thing, you will, you will have the numbers and you will, have, you will be able to say with a certain degree of confidence that something is happening or is not happening. And it's really up to you to decide what risk level. That's why labeling is, is such a good thing because some people will say, hey, I don't care. I'm, I'm willing to take the risks. Um, I'll go ahead and eat it. And another person might say, no, I'd rather not take the risk. And people make those decisions. But any, any kind of experiment in biology is going to be, it's not going to be 100% one way or 100% the other way. So when people often will say, well, can you prove that this is harmful? And I'll say, no, I can't prove that this is harmful. And then it comes out headline, <coughs> proven that it, you know, not proven harmful, I mean, which means nothing. Well, there, there's enough studies that I indicate. just meant the corporate corporation have big legal departments. So yeah. yeah, sure. Universities don't. And public relations yeah. and focus studies and they, 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 they they message their stuff very carefully and deliberately in areas that's going to be favorable to them and avoid like heck, you know, actual uh, stuff that people are concerned with. So, uh, Martin, did you have a question? It was sort of a follow-up, Joan. I, I realize you're not going to get 100 percent of anything, but if you run essentially two art, two experiments, one with genetic mod modification and one without, and you wind up in this one over here is almost all healthy, yeah. this would over here is almost all diseased. Yeah. That's a pretty convincing argument. And I, yeah. I guess the question I would have asked that would have been sure. Charlie, are there any experiments like that that show that, that these GMOs yeah. are, are harmful? Sure, they're, 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 you can go to Earth's open source and they have just, I mean, it just, it just floods of, of, of citations and you can get the abstracts from them. There are several websites that, you know, have this, there's, this group at King's College London that's been putting out just, again, tons of information on this. Yeah, so it's there. And um, um, American Academy for the Environmental Medicine cited some of the most dramatic ones at the time. And Jeffrey Smith's book back there, he's got tons of examples. Um, unfortunately, that book was published in uh, 2007, so, you know, some of the more recent stuff isn't there. We, uh, Seralini has done not just this famous one, but a bunch of other ones that point to some difficulties. So that, you know, there's enough out there to say to me, you know what, there's a lot of smoke here, I don't like the looks of it, and, and couple it with this, there are no consumer benefits to any GMOs on the market today. There are no consumer well, yeah, benefits. Yeah, all the benefits are industry. I have this book, Marty, I'll, I'll be glad to lend it to you. Um, that goes up to 2007. There, there are no consumer benefits, so if I'm looking at a product and I say, wait a second, there's, there's a pretty good probability of risk. And there's no benefit to me. Well, there, there Why must don't be a I cost just choose the, project, yeah. the product next door? Hmm? There must be a cost benefit, or people wouldn't be planting it. No, it's, it's, it's the not benefit to the is to the con not to the consumer, though. Right. It's not to the consumer. I, I don't understand. Well, and and even it actually, cost benefit to the farmer is not a benefit because no. their 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 investment goes higher, their risks the go higher. Well, I mean, why why would they why would they pursue this? Why would they use genetic? They, they, get, they get sold. The, the local. They get sold. The, they get sold on it, and, yeah. the, and, the, and it's what's available. The seed producers, or the co-ops, and the seed companies, they, they, they're, they get all these incentives from Monsanto to sell their seed and convince farmers this is what they want. This is what they, <coughs> I'm they assuming need the farmers are no fools. And if, in fact, but they, they've, been, they've been screwed because now we get these super weeds 
farmers are having to compete with super weeds that are tolerant of the Roundup, of the herbicide that they were pushing. One and of our and most now they're, 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 that's why they want to come up with this 2,4-D, you know, Agent Orange stuff now. One of our most powerful make witnesses even more super weeds. this summer was a farm, a downstate farmer, now there are several like him, who are switching out from from uh, GMO to non-GMO soybeans, and it's hard for them. I mean, you know, their soil is still contaminated, and once they get into it, it's hard to get out of it, but they're, they're doing it. A few it. of the farmers can find uh, uh, some of the micro alternative markets, or in other words, there's one in a thousand silos will take, will isolate or <coughs> uh, take GMO-free corn or soy and sell it to a market that specifically wants GMO-free stuff mostly overseas, that's in China and Japan. Like the Japanese make beer from GMO-free corn. I know a guy in Nikel who does this. And but that's most, uh, I, I should say, uh, that's one in a thousand, but most of the people that are still growing GMO-free hybrids, uh, the, or I should say the few that are out there now, that, that, that just don't want to grow GMOs and they go out of the way, they, they're not getting a premium on their, on their, on their grain and it, it basically breaks even. They're not making any more or less. I know a guy, um, I just talked to someone last night. Um, he has 600 acres, or his dad has 600 acres. He's growing corn and soy and stuff. And he specifically wants GMO-free stuff. He goes, he finds a GMO hybrid, but he's not getting anything extra at the silo when he goes to sell the corn. And it's co-mingled with all the GMO stuff anyway. But that's changing. That's changing because in some places there are, there are starting to be more separate silos because Cargill is not paying. But east, east of the Mississippi, west of the yeah, Mississippi is another right, story. Right, right. Car but Cargill is now paying, um, I think, a two dollar and something uh, a bushel premium for non-GMO because that's what they can sell abroad. Because abroad they don't want. Right. The, the silos are on this side yeah. of the Mississippi where they're uh, doing isolation. There's almost no silos yeah, west yeah, of the Mississippi yeah, that are doing it. Yeah. But in Illinois, there there are more of those. I mean, yeah. so, I mean, it's moving. It's moving. Hmm. Uh, Anita, did you have a question? Um, um, uh, hold it for later. Um, well, I just have a question. I eat a lot of peanuts in the shell. Are those are those genetically? Made? Peanuts are fine. G from, from GMO point of view. From yeah. the chef. Yeah. That's what the chef. You might want to get organic ones but uh, to <laughs> avoid other things. But to yeah. avoid GMOs, yeah. all peanuts are fine. Yeah, yeah not everything that's GMO is necessarily helpful. I mean, you know, that, that's, a whole, that's a different subject. Okay. Yeah. But, but peanuts tend to be organic. Not necessarily. Well, they're not GMO. Okay. That's all. Okay. All right. But if you want to avoid other pesticides and fungicides oh, and all these other things they treated, you can I'm buy good. organic, I'm but you're still getting a GMO-free product okay. with peanuts because there are no GMO prep. But if you want to avoid some of, some of the other things that we like to avoid. Okay. okay. Thank you. Oh, okay. Ted, yeah. you have a question. Um, you mentioned that American scientists um, are intimidated by the industry. Or some, are. some of them are, and uh, many of them feel somewhat silenced or whatever. Uh, well, would European scientists be different? Is there a bigger body of scientific um, literature in Europe? Um, there's, there's more in Europe. There's more. There's more in Europe. Yeah, and, and you can you can see a lot of the citations in in. Um, in this book is very, very highly documented, up to 2007. Um, this is kind of a neat resource book, because one page has the bottom line issue, and then on the facing page, um, sometimes pages, there are a lot more text, and then every sentence in here is documented to the um, footnotes in the back, so you can go to the library and find it. But the, unfortunately, it only goes to 2007, because that's when it was published. In, in Europe, they have, uh, the EU has a mandatory labeling laws over there. Uh, for almost all the food they have, not all of it, but almost all their food has got to have a GMO, contains GMO, it has any kind of a GMO ingredient in it. Um, people in Europe are far more aware of the issue and, you know, able to act on it. You know, they have these labels. Manufacturers there do not want to put that on their labels, so they go out of their way to source GMO-free things. You can still grow GMOs there, you can still sell them there, but you have to label. But because of consumer 
you know, market demands are allowed to work because consumers are informed. People don't want to grow it or use it. So it's very, the numbers of GMO uh, participation or pro-GMO stuff is lower over there. And it's, it's a more friendly environment. Now a question about your activism. Uh, what you're doing is extremely important. Uh, I wonder, is it the two of you um, who is giving you a grant or financing you? <laughs> your, own, your own retirement fund? <laughs> um, and what, what uh, is uh, involved <coughs> in what you're doing? Are you just giving talks or, or having some... We'll do it on the 90% of everything is volunteer, yeah. it's not 100% yeah. volunteer. And, and, I'm not and, paid to come here and talk. Yeah. So you <laughs> like to come and talk places? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. We're doing this well, we'll come and talk because we're true believers. Yeah. So, but, you know, the thing is, the reason, one of the reasons that I talk anyway, and I, I suspect it is one, I can't speak for much, but I suspect it is too, is hoping that, that each of you will say, what can I do? Whether to be a, a more savvy shopper, maybe even go, maybe even calling up um, companies that um, that and, and saying, are there GMOs in your food? Um, and there's a, there there are addresses and their their phone numbers are on their labels. And if they say yes, there are, say, gee, I'm sorry, I, I can't use your food. I have to return it to the store, and I'm going to have to tell all my friends not to use it. Um, or if they say, uh, no, there aren't, oh, well, that's wonderful, now I can use it. And they have to tell you the truth, by the way, that's a legal thing. The other thing is that you'll pick up the phone and call your congressman about Fast Track and the Trans-Pacific Partnership and say, don't vote for these, that you'll pick up the phone, hey there, and call and call your, um, find out who your state legislator is and say, will you support labeling in Illinois? I mean, these are really quick things that you can do. Oh, no, so <coughs> about, about money? You were asking if you want if people want to donate and contribute, they go to our website. We you know all these materials and books and 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 staff. We do have some paid staff to do things. Uh, you have a Facebook you know, our page. Our public relations what? people or our communications people. Facebook page. Uh, we, we both have a Facebook. Page. We we have Facebook page. Our uh, Organic Consumer Association website is on here as well as Illinois Right to Know, um, and then. Almost all the okay. literature on that back table has OCA, Organic Consumer Association. Okay. Uh, so we are GMOs requiring in. less fertilizers and pesticides or more? Are, are GMOs required in the field? Yeah, the myth is that they require less, less pesticides because that the pesticide is for, some, for something is already in the cells of the plant where it's the most toxic and, the, and, and it requires the more weed killer because it goes over the whole field and not just on selected portions. Now, now, when I was talking about the numbers like 90%, 90-95% of soy, um, it's, you're talking about Bt corn. Bt, Bt, uh, anything. Um, but Bt corn is the big, in terms of right. the volume, that's the right. big one. Uh, um, Roundup Ready soybeans and Roundup Ready corn are probably two of the biggest things that are out there. That's so they can sell more Roundup. Monsanto makes Roundup and now they make these Roundup Ready soybeans and corn to tolerate higher levels of Roundup to put on without killing the, the, uh, tar the intended crop. Is so there they used to only be able to put on a certain amount of the stuff without killing the soy plant or the corn plant. Now with this stuff they can do unlimited amounts of this stuff. And, and the sales of this product has gone up like tenfold. It's a vertical integration for benefiting Monsanto. Okay. Uh, okay. How long your name yet? I'm Diana. Uh, but you don't have a question? No. Uh, when you do, raise your hand and I'll write your question. Okay. okay. Yes, Charles. I, I know you passed out a guide here, but a few years ago, we had a speaker, a world-renowned cancer expert, and he said, don't eat this Indian rice, don't eat strawberries. What should I not eat? And I heard 
papaya. You talk about the but that's dozen. not a big part of my diet. What he was probably talking about is the 30 dozen. <laughs> you know, I mean, what do I, that's what do I got to watch out for? And, uh, this is about GMOs and the, the, your talk, speaking but of it's talking about I remember yeah, there were the peanut nuts were a big issue. Oh, the, the, the papaya thing is just is just conventional conventional papaya yeah. from Hawaii is GMO. That that's it. But if it's from Belize, it's it's um, as far as I know not. But is there are, are there any dangerous apples or? Oh God. Something like that. Well, the, the, they have something called the Arctic amp. There's a couple of things that we <laughs> want to put on the market soon. I already talked about the Agent Orange corn and soy. Okay. Yeah. Salmon. Uh, salmon too. <coughs> salmon. GMO salmon. Sam oh yeah. Sa salmon. A, a GMO salmon is coming to market as well. Uh, and hopefully we can stop that from happening. Uh, it's, that'll be the first animal GMO animal product out there. That's not just because they ate GM, GM corn or soy, but act, the actual genetics of the animal are, are, good. are bred to be grow bigger. It's like an invasive species. And when they get out into the natural world, they're going to basically <coughs> decimate the natural species out there. Um, our, our fisheries already have a problem. Um, but uh, apples, yeah, there's something called the Arctic apple that was uh, um, we, we did uh, about you know, about ten months ago, nine months ago, uh, the bio industry was having their convention over at McCormick Place, and we did uh, a rally out front to call attention to this Arctic apple. And what happens with this Arctic apple is uh, that the industry uh, has moved towards pre-cut, sliced, prepared apples already. You know, McDonald's has it. You know, the little packages. Or if you go into a produce department, you'll see large bags of pre-cut, you know, it's for moms to feed the kids, right? That's, that's what this market is. Well, these idiots, they, they, they want to be able to say, we don't pre-treat our stuff with chemicals, okay? That's what they want to be able to do, say that we, you know, make some kind of tricky wording to say we're not doing this. However, what they're doing is shutting off, um, uh, it's a double strand. It's a dangerous technology as far as GMO technologies go. Uh, this is a, what they call double strand technology, and or RNA uh, uh, technology. And what they're um, um, shutting down is uh, the the process. The oleic, oleic acid is it or oleic acid? The oleic acid. Oleic acid. Um, one one of the acids or whatever that makes it nucleic acid. Nu no, um, it's, it's an acid that makes uh, the yeah. apples go brown, basically. Oh, yeah. uh, um, it's, it's, and what it does is shut that off. It prevents it from going brown. So you have an apple that never goes brown, okay? Uh, so they can slice them up, and, and they don't have to treat them to prevent them from, you know, or treat them with less stuff uh, or not as many nasty things to keep prevent them from going brown in the package. But one of, the, one of the things it also does, not only is this RNA technology dangerous, um, but it, it also shuts down the, the apple's natural, the, the same stuff that makes an apple go brown also is like a, uh, um, it's a pet, not, not, insect, it's like an insecticide or it's a resist, makes things resistant to the, to the pests that you know, eat up apples and stuff. So now farmers, are going to want to put more of this stuff onto the apple that are out there growing, although maybe they don't have to, tr you know, pre-treat it after they've sliced it, but they're going to have to put more onto the plant. And apples are already top of the list of this dirty dozen list that we were just talking about. You know, with the strawberries on this list of having too many pesticides and herbicides on them already. Um, apples are at the top of that list as well, and now it's going to be even worse. So an apple a day doesn't make you better. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, you know, and again, this pre-cut <coughs> sliced that apples, that, 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 that's, that market is for kids. Moms, moms to buy this stuff for their kids. And it's reprehensible. What they do. How about we I go to replace? I do too. Yeah. I'm making sure you don't want to get out of there. And, and ca organic carrots are probably one of the most compensant to, to conventional carrots. They're all, and sometimes, sometimes the organic ones are even cheaper 
than the conventional. So you could always buy organic <coughs> carrots and have them not be any more expensive than, or very much more expensive. But they're not GMO. Oh, yeah, we're not talking about GMO. We're just talking about avoiding toxins. One more thing about, you were talking about sugar beets. I eat a lot of beets in a no, can. If you don't eat sugar beets. in a can are fine. They're, they're not. Beet, no, they're not sugar, sugar beets are different. Sugar from sugar beet, or sugar beets, are these big, ugly, giant things. Oh, okay. They're not. The, it's not the you same meat. It's okay. a good question. All right. Other people ask. Yeah, Jeff? I'll, I'll, I'll no, just put your line up for a... Uh, oh, uh, yes, it's time Perhaps. for our rebuttal period. So, and uh, I want to know how many of you have your own observations or uh, ideas to present. One, two, three, four, five, six, uh, maybe even seven. Huh? Go All on. right. Uh, <laughs> give you five minutes to each. Uh, Tim will oh, be keeping the time oh, on yes. it. Yes. Let's thank our speakers. We have Sarah lined up over there. And Gene Parker is taking the first of his chairs. Just sit down and, and, down and watch this. Watch the rebuttals. You'll get a chance to. Speak at the end. Okay. Right. So, yeah. But but it should be limited to five minutes each. Okay. Okay. All right. Let's get started. All right. To begin, Gene Parker. Um. First of all, uh, for about ten years, I've been going to an alternate practitioner which may or may not help, but let me tell you something. Ten years ago, I was slowly going downhill. MDs couldn't help. I'm not against MDs. I still go to MDs. But one thing my, one thing the alternate practitioner told me consistently, I admit I don't listen to him as much as I should. He said, buy organic. Very clear, repeated, over several years of time. Uh, second point is, uh, you know, I've said this before, I know this is old stuff, but it's, e it's fairly easy to find out who your state representative is, state senator, uh, U.S. rep. It's, the numbers are right on your voter card. You probably got all got a voter card in your uh, wallet. Uh, I, I get something called Illinois Issues, and they give me a roster of all the uh, state senators, state representatives. I believe it has the governor and the, all the elected um, uh, spots, too, uh, officials, too. Uh, and you can also uh, get uh, uh, VoteSmart. VoteSmart has your U.S. reps. Uh, you can get that uh, there. Uh, another way I get it is because I'm in an organization called Jane Adams Senior Caucus. And if I need to know that stuff, and if I didn't know it in those other ways, I could ask them, or you could go to the IBI. We heard about the Independent Voters of Illinois. That's another way to find it. It's on this sheet, but You've got to be a computer expert to figure this sheet out. The stuff I got at home, I can figure out. Uh, so if you want to really talk to your representatives, I talk to them face to face. Representative Cassidy, Senator Staines, Representative uh, Chikowski, uh, all the Alderman Harry Osterman. I've talked to all these people face to face through Jane Adams Senior Caucus. Thank you. Gene gave us a little testimonial about organic food after a fashion. I guess I'll start by doing the same thing. Some years before I got to retire from the O'Hara Police Department, I sustained an injury involving sciatica, producing sciatica in the back. And a year plus ago, I happened to be running out of Celebrex, and right around the same time, I 
to, I got the idea of trying organic food. And I haven't even celebrated since. Until then the other day, I ran out of the bread that I'd been eating while eating a piece of toast in the morning each of a organic type of bread, Ezekiel. And so I just ate the regular bread that we had around the house. And this morning I had a sciatica. No, for the first time in however many months or who knows how long it's been. So that's how much difference this stuff can make just in the course of a handful of days or you eat natural ovens, they call it. You've got to call it natural even though it's who the hell knows what. So, yeah, um, thanks much, folks, for doing what you're doing, at least in the sense, especially in the sense, of you know, trying to get folks up to speed as to what has what uh, in it, or it doesn't, or how it was made, and so on. And so it's a wonderful thing that there are outfits like Whole Foods and Trader Joe's. Um, I take it you folks consider the two of those to be roughly equivalent in terms of their conscientiousness, if I understood you correctly. Mm -hmm. They can do a lot better. But well, but yeah, between the two of them, they're it's a, it's a, yeah, they're better. Okay. Than okay. Well, um, <coughs> well, yeah. They are that close. Well, whatever. You know, that's the, 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 you know, I'm not sure it would be any better than any other system. Uh, indeed, in other words, uh, insofar as there are those who would tee off on capitalism, talk capitalism with what's going on here, I quite suspect that it wouldn't be much better in, in, in other kinds of systems for the following reasons. And this gets to a broader point. I'm a little, you know, I was a cop, but I started after a fashion historian. I played a certain niche within historical artifacts. But aside from that, I am a historian in my way. I write about things like this on my website and it pertains to my business. <coughs> the broad point that I want to make is the context in which you, you folks and we all are operating and it's probably in virtually every kind of system, political system and so on. The, the, the world is going to hell. And it's going to hell, the human condition is going to hell in the first instance, in my judgment. Because there has been a decisive change in the technology of the media by which the public are informed or uninformed, as the case may be. The boob tube and the radio and so on has cables that run, run from centralized institutions out, and these cables can be interdicted by Big Bro, whether Big Bro is Uncle Sam, or Big Bro is the boys in the Kremlin, or whoever. Okay? And so Big Bro was over there, and is to this day here, in a position to see to it that very little, if anything, gets on the boot tube. That is not that does not implicitly or otherwise toe the party line. Okay, even if the party line is a small P rather than a big P. Now you've got you know all sorts of books in here, and some of you folks can lay out your books that tell a different story. But when the boot tube doesn't tell the people that this is an important book, and instead it tells the people to go buy the memoirs of Judge Ito or Johnny Cochran, or any of those folks pertaining to stuff that the boob tube has been hyping for, in some cases, decades or whatever, what are you going to get? You're going to get a public that is, for all intents and purposes, a bunch of ignoramuses. Even if they know everything there is to know about Judge Eno and Johnny Cochran. Good old Donnie Rumsfeld, for all his love, <coughs> Put one thing very well. There's a difference between known unknowns and unknown unknowns. And I'll wager you in the main, as far as the American people are concerned, this stuff is a bunch of unknown unknowns. It's, it's only vaguely on their radar screen. And it's not only so just with respect to this stuff, it's so with respect to what they do with their money, how they invest, such as it is, and it's so probably with respect to many, if not most, important aspects of their lives, and certainly 
with respect to how they vote or don't vote as the case may be, and wh wh where, whatever, wherever they put their efforts into anything other than taking care of the kiddies and, and so on, their, 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 their narrow personal uh, situations. <coughs> so that when they become activists in almost I mean, the, the vast preponderance of cases, you know, they'll join Occupy or the Tea Party or some, some outfit, some mass movement that somehow or another manages to get a bunch of play in the mass media. And you've got these lefties and righties hating each other and chewing each other to pieces. But from what I can tell from, from the standpoint of the, the gravest threats to the whole system, virtually none of them have any clue to speak of, it seems to me. They're, except for a handful of folks, whether it's you guys on this, or whether it's, there's, some, there's a handful of folks studying Fukushima, there's a handful of folks writing or talking about the way the financial turds are being swept under rugs with systematic accounting fraud, among other things. You know, we can go on down the list. In each case, you've got just a fraction of the people who write or whatever about this stuff, and, you know, and, and, and on balance, a, just a fraction of the people who have any idea other than what they see on CNBC or CNN or whatever. The, and and what, what we're talking about here, and this is the result in the main, of the domination of the political culture by these mega institutions who can be easily intimidated by, in this case, Uncle Sam. And so what they do is they perform what, uh, my, what my grad school profs called the agenda setting function, whereby there are certain unknowns that are known, and then the more crucial ones in the main are the ones, are the unknown unknowns. So, you know, and then the book I read, is, if you want to read a book or uh, that, that start, gets into this in terms of the history of how this has evolved in the, in the, in the, in the human condition, you can start with a book called Voltaire's Bastards by a certain John Ralston Saul, the second to last chapter of which is called The Faithful Witness, in which he talks about the history of the whistleblower and how the whistleblower had it tough at the beginning, got it better once Gutenberg showed up, but then in this, this last roughly almost 100 years has managed, has, is now again, he's up against it because he has a hell of a time getting on the boot. Whereas in Gutenberg's day, you know, you had five or so printing presses in Germany, and so Luther's pals could, you know, have stacks of the 95 theses printed up. And unless the Pope and his dudes know where, knew where those five printing presses were, then they, then they could have had a blockade. But if they didn't know where they were, they didn't know where to put the blockade, and so dudes could come out of these, well, the castle of the Elector of Wurttemberg who, or whoever it was, with piles of these things and run, ride through town, passing these things all over the place. And before you know it, Luther had a movement bigger than any movement of its kind by, by many, many multiples. And that made all the difference in the world. But now you get these politicians, what sort of movement occupy, okay, they, they occupy a park. And in due course, they are taken care of, and that's it. And the, the country is just being pillaged by the boys on Wall Street and other places. And the vast preponderance of the public are sleepwalking through history, as the saying goes. Yeah. Most of them don't know any better. They don't know what they could conceivably do other than what they're doing. Because they don't see the picture, and they don't see the picture because they're dealing with a bunch of high. Their lights unknown. Uh, yeah, I've been studying this issue for a while, and basically we don't have any conclusive proof that uh, GMOs are bad for you, but these, uh, I mean, these tests take decades to determine the long-term effects of it. I mean, a perfect example would be like the chemical modification of food, like with uh, 
you know, with our trans fats, which is a hydrogenated vegetable oil, which is made by taking vegetable oil, compressing it under high temperature, and adding hydrogen to it. Which it does two things to it, which uh, made it useful to the food industry. It makes it, it, it doesn't spoil, so it's used a lot in processed food, so yeah. they can have a very long shelf life. And also, it, it tastes very similar to butter. It has a creamy flavor like butter, so it's a cheaper butter substitute. They started introducing these in the 50s, and they even touted the health benefits because it doesn't have cholesterol like butter. But uh, recently, uh, recently they found out that it does all kinds of bad stuff to your body. It increases your bad cholesterol, lowers your good cholesterol, and it also inflames your arteries, which uh, greatly increases your chance of having a heart disease like strokes and heart attacks. So, yeah, and the FDA recently banned it, so and they've been labeling it for a while. When they started labeling it, people quit, quit eating it as much, so the use went way down. Now it's completely banned. So I think uh, for GMOs, since we don't know if they're bad for you, some evidence showing good or bad, we don't really know yet, uh, just label it, let people decide if they want to eat it, and uh, leave it at that until we can determine whether it really is good or bad for you. So I'm definitely in favor of labeling GMOs, just let the consumer decide. <coughs> and it seems most people are in favor of that, you know, Republican, Democrat, on you know, all sides of the issue. So uh, big uh, food companies are putting a lot of money in not labeling it because they know if they label it, most people won't buy it. So it's a money issue. I support labeling for GMO products. I firmly believe that if it's so bad for you, let the consumers decide. I'm one who believes in free markets, but free markets that are open and not, how shall we say, deceptive. I firmly believe that when you're given the choice and you're completely rational, you won't eat GMO foods. You will pick the healthier alternatives. If you can afford it. But also, if a demand is there, prices will go down. What many of you, though, fail to realize is that we can get apples, strawberries, lettuce all year round because of globalization, because of worldwide shipping, because of the container, and many other benefits that this globalized economy produces. Farm laborers. Charlie, you know, we're going to get into this a little bit later on, but I am one who is a pro-globalist. I'm one who supports free trade. I think it has been brought, brought more benefits worldwide to more people than ever before. I'm firmly convinced that the structure of the modern corporation, the globalized economic economy, has brought benefits all over the world. The more we cooperate, the more we get into markets and free and truly free markets, not these things that Wall Street, these aberrations that Wall Street has, which even Adam Smith decried as uh, mercantilists or monopolies. What we really need with this whole food thing is open labeling, more competition, more choice to the consumer, and let them make the decisions with their pocketbook. You will soon find that, like a, a restaurant or, or anything else, if they produce a bad product, they'll soon be out of business. If they produce a good, tasty, healthy product, they'll be in business. Now maybe some of the economics of the local farm movement may not be as quote unquote cost effective as some of the global stuff, but you're starting to see a comeback of that local farm movement because people <coughs> want locally grown organic food. And the more we want it, the more the price will come down. And the one thing that is nice is that you can get that locally grown organic Australian lettuce to your supermarket shelf at a place like Whole Foods. You can get strawberries locally grown in, say, New Zealand with genetically GMO-free at a 
another market here in Chicago. Maybe a little expensive now, but as the markets decree and as we move forward, I firmly believe that this will happen. The only reason I say this is because I look at one of the last bastions of free market capitalism or, that are around, and that's the consumer electronics front, where they have all these new devices that seem to come out every year with more and more things on them, and more and more features, and more and more different types of things. And the price generally stays down. You can get a good DVD player for 25 bucks. You can get a lot of the basics of life much cheaper than you could even 50 years ago. Made by children. Well, Charlie, no, not made by children. You see, that's the thing, Charlie. Whoa. A lot of these countries are now passing these labor laws. You're starting to see safety and health in places like Bangladesh where they make these clothing. You're starting to see, as, as the consumer gets more educated, I think that it will happen. And as far as Jeff's comments are concerned in the last year, I don't think we're seeing a massive boob tube deal going down. I'm seeing today more educated people amongst the American public than I've ever had. And it's because of something that maybe you don't know about, Jeff. It's called the internet. Maybe it's something you don't know about, but it's called YouTube. Maybe it's something that you don't know about, Jeff, called the free flow of information. Spitting in the ocean. It is also a principled matter of fact that you can start a movement much cheaper, <clears throat> much quicker, and get your message out much easier than you could even 25 years ago because you're not limited to the major broadcast outlets. I'll give you a case in point, just a little case in point on the movement and how it's growing. Many of you have known that I've come by here in the past and talked about the Thorium Energy Alliance movement and a different kind of nuclear power that's more safer, has the potential to solve global warming, and has the potential to really do things properly. And five years ago, not many people knew about it, except for some maybe obscure scientists. Now, with the proper message going out on YouTube, two or three videographers I know, and people like me talking about it, it's starting to become more widely known. And as more people learn about it, it naturally spreads. You cannot have something when you actually see the truth. The public is not fooled for long. And I frankly don't see a natural dumbing down of the public. And I can tell you that because just because of the way of the complexities of the plots of many of our contemporary TV shows go. If you look at an episode of Gunsmoke from the 1960s, it was just a simple plot. Now you go into some of these serialized dramas today, you almost have to have a guide if you want to pick it up from the beginning of the season if you're going to watch it on what they call an appointment viewing basis. But you can go back and get all the intricacies, intricacies of plot on many of these new serialized dramas that require much more brain stems and brain cells to follow than you would have had years ago. Tim, compare us to Western Europe. I think that we have a long way to go mm -hmm. before we start achieving some of the standards that Western Europe has as far as broadcast or food labeling or other items like that. But at the same time, uh, I see Western Europe as a place where it's not all rosy right now. We have a lot of large government deficits over there. We have a lot of systemic problems with, the, with movement of people and goods across Which the country place. cooks their books best? That's the yeah. question. <laughs> and, frankly, the best thing that could happen to, to Europe, Eastern and Western Europe, is a unification and a comprehensive reform of their government to become more federalist like the United States does to become a larger trading bloc, to compete with <coughs> us, and the same thing with Africa. The one thing you guys may not realize is that, you know, over the last 300 years, the population has just gotten better off as a general rule. 
because of capitalism and the economic system we have today. Because they pillaged oh, the world's yeah. oil. Oh. Oh. Huh? They pillaged the world's oil and coal, and now the barrel oh. is almost dry. Which is why we need to go to thorium MSRs to replace it. Yeah. We're not dry. Not like we made, like we made carbon our slaves, and we got rid of slavery. Just imagine when we can make thorium our slave and really get the energy thing going yeah. and really industrialize and really begin to bring people's lives you know, back yeah. up in order. They ain't got the religious yum yet from what I understand. I'm working on that in my basement. Uh, you all brought up uh, some interesting statistics. Um, you said that uh, about 95% of soybeans, 85-90% uh, of corn is GMO, and that most of the stuff in the regular and uh, conventional uh, grocery stores is GMO. So it contains GMO. Contains. So uh, the vast majority of Americans, uh, I assume, are ingesting GMO. Most, most, most corn is fed, is either burned up as biofuels, or fit the animal. Only a small proportion of, of the GMO corn market ends up in human food. I mean, that's another piece of it. But, but almost all, yeah, but, almost yeah. all ingredients is a huge amount of ingredients contain a certain amount of corn. So your GMOs are going to be in, either in soy, you know, corn, or sugar. Yeah. So 75 percent, to 85 percent or so of everything in the grocery store store shelves contain ingredients that include right. one or more GMO right. ingredients. Right. So people are eating a lot of GM, uh, GMO infested <coughs> 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 stuff. <Okay. coughs> That's on the one hand. On the other hand, 90% um, uh, of uh, the American people uh, in polls uh, want GMO labeling, right? In other words, are concerned about uh, GMOs and probably would choose not to eat GMOs. You want to have the right to choose. Right, right. So uh, my point is that there are a lot of things that are going on in this country, like GMOs, that uh, America, the American people would not put up with if they had control. And I think that uh, the basic problem that we have in this country is that the American people do not have control. They do not rule. This country is not a democracy uh, in the strict sense of the word. Uh, our representatives, quote unquote, uh, are mostly rich people who don't represent uh, the American people demographically. Uh, they're not like the vast majority of American people. And the people that they answer to are very rich people, even richer than themselves. So in, in no sense of the word do uh, uh, our representatives, quote, unquote, represent the American people. They represent corporations. Exactly, so exactly, nice. exactly. So, um, and they pay no price. Hmm? They pay us for kissing the ass. <laughs> well, they benefit, as a matter of fact. So uh, one of the things that uh, some of us um, activists are, are doing is working on um, making this country a democracy. Um, which would mean changing the entire uh, system. So, you know, you, you mentioned that um, we should contact our uh, representatives. I'm sorry to say that's probably not going to do a lot of good because they don't answer to us. Um, so th these are some of the topics that I'm going to talk about more at length next week um, on uh, we'll talking a little bit about Occupy uh, and what happened to Occupy and the organization that uh, has grown out of that called uh, organization uh, um, Democracy uh, for the USA. Mm -hmm. Which so. group you are with? A democracy for the USA. New group. A new group, yes. Do you speak next group. week? He's the yeah. new group, I guess. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. You got a lot of advertisement there. Uh, we'll hope to see you next week here, this gentleman. He's got a lot of good ideas. First timers, so be easy on him. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I won't be easy on you guys. First of all, let me thank both of our speakers for coming out and coming out and sweet, um, and the rest of you as well. You deserve credit because this is an important issue. It's been around for a long, long time. Actually, I recollect being outside the the federal building there on Jackson many years ago and there was a guy dressed up like an ear of corn <laughs> and they had these kids I brought it some info on this they were little butterflies mm -hmm. and we, we were calling it Franken food then you know 
And all the butterflies who died, they, they died when they ate that corn. G was. Was that a, yeah, it was pretty cool. Uh, but we've had the issue covered a couple times here. Um, as I said, I'm going to be eclectic, jumping around. And I realize there's a number of uh, libertarians here tonight. <laughs> Nevertheless, one of the inherent functions of government, and a very good function of government uh, that can't be delegated or assigned to anyone else, is um, ensuring nutrition, that, you know, public health. That when in fact, I'm, I'm, I think I'm a pretty sharp guy, but when I go into a grocery store, I'm not certain what's food and what isn't. <laughs> There's about three to five thousand items, I believe, in any, in a good-sized grocery store, um, and I don't know what's what has nutritional value and what does not. And I have to rely on objective authorities, such as the government, and that's what I think is the defining issue here. Is is the government going to take the side? of the citizenry, or is it going to turn itself over to agri business in order to make money and profits? Um, and obviously, uh, now, you're also um, confronted, there's some other issues here that are complex, and it's probably an inexact science, but nutrition and health uh, is it's not a precise exact science, unfortunately, at this time. I, I remember two arguments. We had a big fight here many, many years ago, two senior citizens, whether or not it was a, appropriate to drink milk. I had to separate these two guys. <laughs> they almost came to blows. <laughs> we had a vegan and a, one of our regulars, and they I had to separate them. They were... They were pretty close to it, you know, and I settled things. We had another guy, um, my friend, co-worker, actually, he was upset that somebody recommended that you should, it was okay to consume honey, you were talking about honeybees. Mm -hmm. uh, he kept sending literature for a literature table for about six weeks. We'd get articles off the internet warning us not to consume honey. Um, honey or money? Honey. 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 You know, which is the material, right? but nevertheless, and actually just the other day I got a telephone call, I had a little health issue here, and the, the caller was really good and he gave me something, but he ended up giving me some dietary advice, how I should change my diet. I have to admit that none of the physicians I had been examined by mentioned any of this diet alterations, but it was good advice, nevertheless. But turning over our food to free market capitalism, they don't really care about you. They don't really care what happens to you. Uh, they will enslave people, such as those in the United Farm Workers, in order to harvest this thing cheaply, in order that they can make money. Uh, anybody who Trust agri business, I think, is an irrational individual. <laughs> it probably is a good idea to have the government look at this, have some good federal employees such as myself establish standards. <laughs> but you're a right? That should be applied well, uniformly you, right? for the benefit of all of us. <laughs> and last of all, though, I got to admit, though, that. I used to live in that for years in Apple Country, out there in Pennsylvania, places like that. The concept of a tenure, keeping an apple for five or ten years, though, does sound intriguing. <laughs> 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 I mean, you can imagine buying one now and having it in 1923 or something. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, thank you very much. It's an important issue. Donald specializes in making things last a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, uh, like a thing, like a thing, you know, Kind of uh, yeah. echoing on, on uh, some of the 
ideas here for making a change. And um, my conclusion is similar to yours, Ted, that uh, in this system, uh, we are fooling ourselves. <coughs> we may call the senator to feel good. You get the voicemail and uh, that's it. Um, and your attack on Occupy, um, probably some of it is, is um, valid, uh, but you forgot one factor. Do you remember who was it when I asked him to come with me to the streets and join Occupy? Jeff said, I don't want to go on the streets because they, they will know my name, they know my name, they spy I'll on you. I'll dig up the, the email, Ayala, let's talk about it next week. <laughs> okay, uh, but it's not just personally against you, but it is the feel fact of people are so intimidated to uh, make a change, to go and voice their, their objections, to just go out to the streets and, and voice it, that um, no change will come out of this field. We need to deal with the field factor first. If it's run well, I'll consider it. If this was a joke, and we'll talk about that next week. There are no other rebuttals. Our speakers will. If yeah, you're familiar with Charles Hugh Smith's views on this, go look him up. Go ahead, Charles. Speakers get the last and word. And Archduke Bruce. Yeah. Yeah, just two, two quick things. Um, and I already said something um, to you about this. Okay. The Trans Pacific. I I am I am for tr for free trade, but it has to be. It really has to be debated openly in Congress. It yes. has to be good for all concerned. Yes. Um, and TPP is a trade agreement that goes far beyond, far beyond anything we've seen before um, in a trade agreement. Um, one analogy would be something that could happen under TPP. This wasn't under a trade agreement, but Philip Morris is currently suing the country of Australia for um, requiring quite graphic uh, warnings on cigarettes and saying that this could cut into its profits, so they're suing for those lost profits. Uh, and, uh, and that's the kind of thing that TPP would allow. It, it would set up uh, the possibility that a corporation that felt that a, a law, like against fracking or, or to label GMOs or something, might cut into its profit, they could actually, um, they could actually have that law uh, rescinded or, or bring suit that would be filed, not in a normal federal court, but in a court um, of judges that especially were selected very often lawyers from industry who would be deciding these cases. So it's really a quite a quite a nefarious thing. The second thing is there are a few things that look on their face to be good about GMOs. Um, none of them have really come to light yet. The most famous one is called golden rice. And probably most of you have heard of it. This rice that is bred to has been genetically modified to produce more vitamin A. It's not even it, there's so many problems with it that it's nowhere near marketing, but it's become the poster child for GMOs. Um, some of the problems that um, with, the, with the whole idea of golden rice is first of all, a, a child would have to eat or an adult would have to eat an enormous quantity of rice to get anywhere near the, the minimum daily requirement of vitamin A, something like a pound of dry rice for a child or, or seven pounds of dry rice for an adult, some huge number. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that there are plants already being, being cultivated, uh, being grown that are not genetically modified, but they were simply bred using traditional uh, seed selection methods that grow very well in different kinds of climates. There's a, a sweet potato, for instance. There's some other kinds of plants that are very rich in vitamin A and could easily be grown um, in, in uh, people's backyards, basically, and, and propagated with cuttings that people could share with each other. There's a website about this, and I can't remember what the URL is, but. Um, this is the kind of thing that we should be looking for. It's a low tech, low cost. It's not going to make big profits for any industry, and it's it's here with us now. So some of the things that are that are that look really great turn out to be a genetically modified pie in the sky. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. Talk about fast tracking. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, we talked about, I talked about fast track okay. already, which would be, which would be, um, yeah. a pers it's before Congress now, a bill that would give Congress the authority, that would give Congress the authority to, to outsource to the president of these trade agreements that the president could then outsource to his uh, trade people, to corporations, and it would last for five years, not only for the remaining term of this president, but for, for whoever was the president. Um, in a few years um, in the future. So please call your representative. And I'm sorry that, that I made it seem hard, but most people, I, I don't even know what my voting card is, to tell you the truth, and I don't carry it with me. This is a quick way, even on your smartphone, that you can find your rep. Well, what, what is the number on the, the bill? The bill has, it just was introduced, and I don't have the number, but everybody knows, if you call your representative and say, vote no on fast track, or if you want to get more technical, vote no on the Trade Promotion Authority. Um, they will know what you mean. Believe me, it's gotten a lot of um, it's gotten a lot of press. You can find it on the congressional website. Yeah, I'm sure it's I'm, I'm sure it's on a website. It just was introduced a couple of days ago, and I don't have it with me. Okay. Well, well, on the TPP stuff, it's it's a basically a race to the bottom. It's not just a trade thing. They're, they're, they're trying to minimize or, or make standards as so low, basically undermining our environmental, our, our food safety, all sort of standards, labor standards, uh, internet standards. Um, they, they, want to, they want to control the internet, you know? Uh, you know, talking about information and where we get it from. Um, so, Oh yeah, they want to extend patents as well. This is this is being used as a ruse to to benefit big corporations uh, to do what they would otherwise not be able to do. Uh, it's not about trade so much. They just want to use you know claim trade issues related to so they can extend their patents. You know, make you know charge 20 times more than some other companies can sell their drugs for. Um, all right, enough on TPP and stuff. Oh, lots of stuff. Um, yeah, about the media and disinformation. Totally agree with that. I mean, that's 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 all. That's it's corporate control of the information. There's a a good five four part five point BBC series called Century of the Self. Talks about how about propaganda and messaging and how how we got into the situation we are in terms of. Uh, uh, how corporations control, um, it, it's like uh, what Norm Chomsky talks about, uh, manufacturing consent, okay? Um, so you guys might want to look up uh, Century of the Self and check it out. Can you repeat that? Century of the Self, it's from the BBC. You can find it on the internet and watch it free on the internet. It's about Bernays and Yes, uh, Freud's uh, nephew and daughter, Bernays and his daughter came here and instead of using uh, some of Freud's findings about uh, uh, our what goes on psycho psychologically inside of us. They, they're, instead of using it to promote democracy, uh, they got together with the corporations and started using it for marketing to make us a, go from a, we were ba basically a needs-based society. They, they wanted to turn us into a more of a wants-based society. <laughs> So that we it's both, a mind control. We would, right, it's mind control. It's it's make it make us feel more inadequate about ourselves unless we possess their product. And that's that's basic. That's basics. Basics of marketing 101. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it goes back to Bernie's. My hero. Well. <laughs> and if your message doesn't get undercut by the whistleblower, <laughs> you're home free. <laughs> okay. Right. Well, the, yes, the whistleblowers too. Um, well, a lot of us use actually these marketing tools as well in pro you ain't got promoting the mic. Our, our message as well. Yeah, but you ain't got the mic. But we're not. You don't have the mic. Well, you can hear me. Well, I'm talking about on the metaphor. You don't have right, the mic. Right, okay. You know, I mean, right. yeah. So, all right. Um, let me not spend too much time on. Uh, there was a sea change. Um, yeah, we've been doing this. Uh, GMOs have hit the market, hit the marketplace or the consumer market in the early mid-90s, 94, give or take. And we've been doing, some of us have been doing this that long, um, including myself. I was dumping BGH milk into the streets in that first year, and then stomping on Flavor Saver Tomato, another product that failed in the 
marketplace. Um, but in the past three years, uh, two or three years, there's been a major, major sea change in public's awareness and objection to this stuff. And now we're seeing the 90% numbers of people who want mandatory labeling. So there's been a major, major change in the past <coughs> few years. You know, the green pol you know, uh, politicians, and uh, I spent 20 years as a theoretical anarchist. That means no voting, no participating. I've changed that in the past year or two. Um, to what? I think participating in the system can work, but we're being undermined by big, giant corporations and controlling the money and controlling who, controlling uh, uh, these, these representatives. I'm in favor of more of uh, what some of the states have uh, binding uh, ballot initiatives. You know, a more form, better form of direct democracy where everyone gets an equal vote on a decision. They can still buy, like they did, they can still influence, buy a lot of influence and fool a lot of people with their ads, but it's a more level playing field and it, it can work. In, in this state, we don't have binding initiatives, so we have to rely on these representatives who are easily influenced by big money. But if enough people call them, they do start getting scared about getting voted in the next time. And they might, and they might some of them do change, you know, their, their tune, and actually do represent us, okay? But it takes an awful lot, it's a, an unreasonable, but still it takes a lot, of, a lot of effort to do it, okay? But, um, so I don't, know, I don't want to go too far into that debate. But um, there has been a big sea change, and we can make a difference, but we have to. I mean, like this Illinois law, um, whether, whether it happens this year or not, you know, or the, in this legislative session, I'm not holding my breath, but that has brought a lot of awareness. This, this working on this campaign and, and talking to people has brought huge amounts of awareness to people and empowering people. I mean, there's something we can do about this at the state level. That's why they're trying to uh, sidestep us at uh, going to a federal law. We wanted a federal law too, but that's not going to really happen until the states start doing their work in, in their states. And they're complaining about, oh, you know, it's too inconsistent. Two different states have different laws and stuff like that. Well, actually, most of them are very consistent with each other. But just the same, nothing is really going to happen federally until we start really making the changes at the state level. And that has begun, okay? But we have to continue doing that work there if we're going to see something positive at the federal level. Um, right, what to talk about next? Oh, um, we talked about studies and the long. There's been really no, no long-term studies on this stuff. The longest, the sta longest of the standard is 90 days. So that's three months. That's the long-term studies we've been getting out of people, out of scientists and universities and institutions in the United States. Um, we do need to look to outside the states uh, for that because, frankly, scientists are intimidated. A lot of them, it's a career ender. They commit, you know, the joke is they commit career suicide to go up against the GMO or genetic engineering industries, okay? They're funding a lot of university the research, this, these big industries. <clears throat> the head that stays bowed doesn't get chopped off. No joke, right. So, um, so we we need to look to outside of the states to for research, um, and there is some out there. Um, what next? Where are my notes? Um, pollinators. Oh, a whole bunch of things. The, a lot of this issue, in terms of the, the the negatives, it's not just about health risks or or you know, health detriments that we know about, or risks, other risks that may be theoretical or not. Um, this is about giant corporations trying to control the food supply. You, you, uh, Joan alluded it a little bit, talking about Kissinger, about controlling the oil, you know, financial oil economies, but also about controlling food, control the people. This is a lot about controlling, uh, uh, dominating the world food markets. You know, our, or, or where our food comes from. They want to vertically integrate it so they're the ones, you know, having to make the, make the decisions about what kind of food and where we get our food and, of course, profit from it. This is about dominating our world food supply. And they're well on their way of doing it. So we need to stop them. 
uh, and GMOs is one of, the, one of the ways they do that. They get all these farmers to sign contracts that they won't save their seed. People have been saving their own seed for millions of years, you know, yeah. 10,000 years, you know, since the beginning of agriculture, you know. It's a biblical imperative. It's, it's 10,000 years since the beginning, or 15,000 years since the beginnings of agriculture. Um, and now they want, they want to control who saves the seed, who sells and who access, access to our food. Uh, it's ridiculous. Um, and they, they literally, they go around suing people and, and intimidating farmers that grow their own or sell, save their own feed, or the, 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 there's a few dryers out there that actually dry and help farmers. You know, the farmers hire these people to dry the seed and all that. A lot of them have gone out of business because Monsanto is intimidating them as well. Um, all right. Uh, small farmers being exploited, they have to sign contracts, the costs go up, we talked about that already. Uh, they want to play mad scientists, uh, you know, around the world. Oh, environmental issues are pollinators. So I talked a little bit about bees earlier relating to nicot nicotinoids. Um, and uh, bee, uh, the bee uh, population going down. Uh, 40 to 90 percent the die off last year. Butterflies, though, monarch butterflies and other butterflies and other pollinators are also in trouble as well. Specifically, monarchs were relying on milk, the milkweed plant. That's their main food, and and where they breed, where they, you know, they. Uh, they came back though. They're critical, but the the milkweed is in decline as well, and it's because of Roundup, Monsanto's Roundup sprayed everywhere and there's uh, a lot less uh, milkweed plants now thus there's a lot less butterflies or monarch specifically monarch butterflies they're under attack as well I wanted to make that point on the environmental there's other environmental costs lots of other ones but that was one of the ones that resonates with a lot of people um, you had a question did you have a question no? For me? Yeah. No, I said I read that the monarchs came back to the Midwest. Uh, they're, they're still in decline. They're in trouble right now. Um, I would be interested in reading what you read. So in, uh, maybe probably you can in uh, point Science it out News, a which is a digest Science News probably. But well, from what I understand, they're still in big trouble. Yeah. So, um, and all pollinators in general are. Um, Cost of organics. Yeah, we, we're going to have to keep going. Okay. Uh, just got a comment related to cost of organics. Uh, there's a reason they cost more, and it's not because it costs more to produce them. Uh, it, it's because the conventional industry gets a lot more subsidized than the organic farmers. Um, because organic farming, it, you actually have a lot less inputs. You, know, you don't have to buy all these chemicals and all this. You get you get a lower yield out of your crop, but in, in on balance you make more money. Uh, uh, you make more money going organic, but the the problem is the conventional farmers are more uh, subsidized, thus they make more money. What about the preservatives? In other words, if you put a bunch of preservatives, you don't need to refrigerate the stuff. Doesn't the refrigeration add to expenses? Well, in, in the, I mean, I, at the home, at the user level? Well, no, at the, in the whole chain. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, okay. Okay. well okay. animal products need to be refrigerated. Pardon? Animal products. Mostly. Well, what about bread? It's like I say, Ezekiel bread has to be refrigerated. Yeah. You know, yeah. Nature's path doesn't. Uh, <laughs> say, thank you all for coming. Thank you. Uh, oh, hey. Wendy. Going yeah. back. And uh, thank you, yeah. Mike, and thank you, thank you, Joe. Yep, yep, yep. I'll be around for a minute, so if anyone wants to. So, GGG.